superficially. We kind of take the immediate meaning or the obvious thing and we grab onto it and we want to get on to the next scene, the next story, the next chapter. And so we, we scrape over the depth of these stories and Jesus' parallels. And I think that this one is no exception. Most of us walk away having focused on the multiplication of the fish and loaves, that there were all these people and just a little to provide for them, and yet that was accomplished. It's a story we were told again and again and a lesson we learned years ago in our childhood in Sunday school. And that kind of stayed with me until a few years back. I read an interpretation that challenged that as well as broadened my understanding of that text that was written by John Barclay. John Barclay is a well-known scholar and a preacher, and in his commentary, he says that multiplying the fish and the loaves is really not as miraculous as we've made it. What? Well, Barclay's point is really kind of simple and in some ways really very, very obvious. Barclay says, well, God does this all the time. God multiplies fish and loaves all the time. A seed is planted in the ground, it grows, it's harvested, it's kneaded, it's baked into bread, and it feeds the masses each and every day. The same is true for fish. They live, they spawn, they breed, they multiply. They multiply naturally within the order of creation. The difference, Barclay points out, is you know, that the time required here in this story is compacted. The time required for Jesus is certainly extraordinarily short. But when you think about it, there is nothing that is accomplished here that is beyond our understanding. We know how fish multiply and we know how bread and wheat are multiplied as well. Hence, Barclay's conclusion that it may not be as miraculous as we think. Remember this the next time you go to the grocery store. Instead, Barclay says the real miracle here that we overlook is the fact that Jesus was able, with all these people around and just that little amount of food, that Jesus was able to get the disciples to share. That they looked around and they didn't say anything ridiculous. I mean, I'm not a math whiz by any stretch of the imagination. Logically speaking, if you looked at all those people and you looked down at what you had, you'd say, this isn't going to happen. This isn't going to happen. And what happens with us? Self-preservation kicks in. Watching out for number one. This is not extraordinary. You know, you look at that and you say, Jesus, have you lost your mind? This isn't going to work. And so maybe Barclay is on to something. The real miracle is that they somehow had faith enough to believe that they could do it. And, and of course, we are told they not only could accomplish feeding the thousands, but there was some left over. And given all those circumstances, that's amazing. However... <laughs> It's not my takeaway today. I just shared that because I thought it was interesting, right? Instead, the message I find and repeatedly need to hear when I read this text is how often we underestimate the dynamic nature of God. That's what I got out of this, how often we underestimate sell short God. We talk, we pray, we sing, and I preach a lot about it, and it's even an excuse for using really, really big words. Omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. You know, we, we get to use those big words even though we can't fully explain them. We use them, we describe God in this way, and then we live in a manner that says and sends a very different message. It can't be done. It's impossible. 
No way, are you kidding? What a waste of time, you fool. And quite frankly, when we say these things, we find ourselves in pretty good company. You know, build what, Noah says to God? Go before to who and free the slaves, Moses says, regarding the call to meet Pharaoh? Say, what's going to happen after three days dead? A resurrection? Come on now, I wasn't born yesterday. These are natural, natural responses. And yet all these people are proven wrong. Each sold God short, and each was proven wrong. But here is where I take comfort, is that the Bible says these individuals who even had doubts, even had fears, even had some disbelief, God still called them good and faithful. God still said these people, despite their doubts and their weaknesses, these people can still fulfill the tasks and overcome their doubts and find out that it is possible. And that's good news for us. I think that's really good news because it tells me and it reminds me that, and if I'm honest, I'm guilty of all these same characteristics. Selling God short, not believing it can happen. Doubting, doubting the promises laid before us. You see, and if it works for them, it can work for us. You see, faith is not so much a matter of what we believe. I think we have robbed the Christian tradition in Western culture by limiting or trying to box in what faith is about. In other words, we've come up with platitudes and we've come up with creeds and we've come up with statements of faith, but they're ours. We came up with those. We drew those up. And then we said, this is what you have to acknowledge and accept. I don't think that's, well, I know that's not the way Jesus operated. Rather, Jesus, it says, encountered people and looked on them with compassion. He looked on them with compassion because he knew, he knew that in their lives they had been lied to, they had been betrayed, they had been robbed, people had schemed to take what was theirs at any cost and in any manner. Jesus said, I know what it's like to be you. I know what it's like, and I know why you doubt, and I know why you have fears. But then he dares to say, but I'm different. And here comes the clincher, the wonderfully hard part. He says, trust me. And that's, that's what's difficult, trust me. Elton Trueblood, another great pe uh, preacher and scholar, he, he said it in this way. He said, faith is not belief without proof, but trust without reservation. I see some pins starting to move, so let me say that again. Faith is not believe, belief without proof, but trust without reservation. You know, of all the symbols we have, and you can look around the church and the sanctuary, there's all these symbols that remind us of, of uh, stories in the Bible, or they remind us of different uh, messages that the church over the years has wanted to send to worshipers. But the one that is most intriguing and compelling to me is that of the Trinity. And the Trinity is something that has caused conflict and problems with other world religions because this notion of one in three and three in one, you know, you can't rationalize it. You really can't make sense. And it's always de uh, depicted by three intertwined or interwoven circles or triangles to remind us of understanding God as, uh, you know, God the Creator and Christ the Savior and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, that there are these three interwoven elements, uh, a community in the divine itself. But what that says to me is that you can point at God as the Creator and you can point at Jesus the Savior, but God is more than all those. That, that the circles are floating and that no matter how we try to no matter how we try to define or label or confine God, 
God is more. God is about something more. You know, in the United Church of Christ, we are all familiar with Gracie Allen and her last letter to George Burns where she said, never put a period where God has placed a comma. God is always about more. And we need to remember that. Let me ask, would God be God if God was less uh, limited to everything I know? Sometimes I, I, probably you do too, you know, in our opinions, we kind of think we're God, right? But that's sad because if God is limited simply to what I think or even all of us think, we still shortchange God. So then why do we draw lines, create boxes, make checklists for determining the right faith? God knows what it's like to be us. The Christian narrative says that, but in conclusion, we said, yeah, but God is still more. For as the prophet Isaiah so poignantly stated, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are our ways God's ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so God's ways are higher than our ways and God's thoughts greater than our thoughts. Our challenge is to cling to this. Not by eliminating doubt, you know, that somehow we're bad or we're evil or we're weak or we're not good Christians if we have doubts. The Gospels conclude the final moment Jesus has with his disciples, the Gospels say, and some of them still had doubts. It's just part of being human. But we overcome those. We don't eliminate them, but we overcome them when we remember all the times in our past when God got us through it. Those times we succeeded when the odds were desperately against us. Those times when everybody around us said it can't be done. Those times when we felt like failures and yet things turned out many times better than we could have imagined or planned. And people say, wow, you were a success. And you look back and you say, I haven't got a clue how I did that. By the grace of God, we are here and we have done it. So I don't know what challenges you all face. I don't know. You know, I don't know what obstacles stand in your way. I don't know what fears or worries at this moment clutter up your mind. I don't know how hard it is for you to deal with life when it feels like you can't control it. And then I've got a clue for you, you never could. Truth is, I'm only all too well of my own personal struggles and doubts. But in, we're in response, this text says, don't underestimate God. Do not sell God short. Never, ever underestimate God's forgiveness and love, steadfast nature, and God's constant and eternal desire for our good. Because when you are down to nothing, God is always up to something. When you are down to nothing, God is up to something. You know, some days it's about multiplying fish and loaves, and other days God's about things that are much bigger and greater. Our part is to live accordingly with trust. And when we do this, like the disciples, we just might, be dis might just be surprised at what happens. May it be so. Amen.